Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, all the panelists. This morning, I shall be speaking on the challenges in the management of cleft palate. My, just a minute, please. Okay. Now I'm sharing my slides. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Good. Yeah. So my outline is as presented. I'll be stating why I chose this topic give us a brief introduction, and then look at some of the peculiarities of cleft palate compared with cleft lip. A word on the goals of cleft palate repair, and then I'll try to look at our challenges under the various aspects of what I think would significantly impact on our ability to perform these surgeries drawing specifically from my own personal experience as a surgeon. The objectives, what do I hope to achieve by this? Um, first of all, let me say, I want to thank the small train for presenting this opportunity to me to speak. And I thought about this when I considered my practice and some of the hitches I had faced in the course of trying to you know, care for cleft palate, palate patients. So the first thing I want to do is to highlight some peculiar challenges, especially in an environment such as ours that is constrained in resources, as some of these challenges could significantly, you know, mitigate the delivery of quality cleft care to our cleft palate patients. Second point I want to emphasize is to prepare the young cleft palate surgeon, you know, for these challenges. Because a lot of these challenges, if we do not think of them ahead of time, they may end up, you know, causing some form of disillusionment in the palate surgeon. And uh, ultimately this could affect, you know, the care of these cleft palate patients. And, the other thing this could result in is that there could be a screen of preference for surgery. You know, when we don't overcome the challenges in caring for the palate patients, we just might tend to only care for those who have cleft lip and, uh, you know, neglect inadvertently, even though it may be that of patients who have cleft palate. And uh, the third thing I hope I can do is to you know, stimulates the need for more support in caring for these cleft palate patients. When we identify their peculiar issues, I hope that we'll be able to see that there is a need to deploy more in supporting the care of the cleft palate patient compared with that of the cleft lip. While I was thinking about this topic, I came across this article that was published in the cleft palate craniofacial journal in the year 2014 on global variation in cleft palate repairs. And uh, it's interesting to note that this study was drawn from the Smile Train database and uh, it consisted of 352,199 consecutive cleft operations that were performed between 2008 and 2011. And it's interesting to note that the studies concluded that many babies that are born with cleft palates in resource poor regions do not have their palates repaired based on the you know, comparative ratio of cleft lip and palate that is expected. You know, and this further strengthened my talk and I felt this is a good thing to refer to because it, it makes, 
lends credence to the fact that cleft palate babies are probably not receiving as much care as they should. And what are some of the reasons? Though the study profiled some of the reasons as a possible, you know, increased neonatal mortality, which is true, and that you know, the cleft palate patients, you know, may be lacking in, in, in facilities in some of these environments. So historically, so going to the introduction, historically, the evolution of cleft palate care was dated that of cleft, cleft lip by centuries. In about three centuries after cleft lip was being treated, then, you know, surgeons in the past began to come up with plans for treating cleft palate. And Franco in 1561, a French surgeon was noted, was quoted to have said specifically that those who have cleft palates are more difficult to kill. So right from the beginning, the peculiarity of the cleft palate being more difficult, more challenging to you know, manage has been known right from the beginning you know, of the evolution of care. And uh, it was only more recently in the 19th and 20th centuries that you know, surgical techniques you know, for the treatment of cleft palate really evolved. And this evolution has continued even into the last couple of decades where a more detailed understanding of the muscular anatomy of the palate and the implications of, you know, appropriateness of repair in ensuring quality outcomes as regards speech, you know, have uh, evolved. Now, what are some of the peculiar differences between uh, cleft palate compared with cleft lip? Obvious, visibility. The cleft palate is a hidden deformity. I mean, that is just stating the obvious. And uh, as obvious as that is, we discover that many patients, you know, are even missed at birth. So the challenge with cleft palate care actually begins from here. Because when the defect is missed at birth, unlike the lip, which is usually very obvious and uh, causes a lot of distress for the patients and the relatives and attention is given to it and they are highly motivated to seek treatment. That of the palate being hidden can cause it to be missed. This can lead to delayed presentation. And because it is also hidden, there may be less motivation to seek treatment. You know? And because the effect of the cleft of the palate, especially if it is not resulting in regurgitation of feeds you know, early in infancy, you know, the relatives might not be that motivated and they may kind of develop apathy, you know, to the repair. So this in itself poses a major challenge. Now for the surgeon also, the outcome of surgical treatment is often hidden within the patient's oral cavity. And sometimes when some of these outcomes are not uh, pleasant or, you know, unsatisfactory, it might just be left as such. And, uh, you know, this also poses a, a, a major challenge because the patient may just, you know, continue with his life. And since the outcome is also hidden, the surgeon is also not facing any, you know, serious embarrassment except with respect to the particular patient. Then in cleft palate, nutrition is more of a problem, especially in the more severe ones. And these nutritional problems, you know, can often come with recurrent respiratory tract infections, you know, malnutrition, and all of this will predispose the cleft palate patient to intercurrent infections, you know, like uh, malaria. And some of these, you know, can really worsen the, the, the state of the cleft palate patient by the time you are seen. The other, make, I mean, visible difference is that surgically, when uh, uh, seeking to treat the cleft palate, the access is much less compared with treating a cleft lip surgically, you know, and then the, the, the surgical care of the palate is more technically challenging. You know, general anesthesia is invariably required. You know, some studies have reported treatment of cleft lip patients, especially in adults with the uh, local anesthesia. And then the risk of airway compromise is much higher in the 
treatment of the cleft palate patient. Of course, when it comes to the possibility of treating the patient either as a day case or as an inpatient, the cleft lip has been treated as day cases and patients have gone home, but cleft palates, no, for obvious reasons. And sometimes even the care of these cleft palate patients may require intensive care units uh, admissions, you know. So these are peculiar differences that make uh, cleft palates to be more challenging. Then of course, associated with the defect of cleft palates are speech and hearing problems. And these have implications in that there is a need for specialists to take care of these problems and definitely increasing the, the, the demands of on the cleft palate patient's management. And then ultimately all these factors put together, you know, increase the risk to life in the cleft palate patient compared with the patient with cleft lip. So it's obvious that many of these factors that we have listed above emphasize that there is a need for more resources to prepare for and to operate the cleft palate patient compared to preparing and operating a cleft lip patient. So this in itself poses a challenge. Go on to the next slide. The goals of cleft palate repair are well known. The anatomical reconstruction of the defects in the palate. And of course, the correction of speech defects, which is also linked to the type of surgery that is performed. And then the maintenance of adequate velopharyngeal competence, which is also essential for speech. And of course, restoring normal dental occlusion. So the challenges, I go on to the challenges now and I take them, you know, section by section, depending on the different uh, issues. The first one I want to address is the issue of manpower. This is well known for the appropriate management of the cleft palate patients. The cleft team is critical. This team being made up of orthodontists, surgeons, who could either be oral or maxillofacial surgeons, in some instances, otorhinolaryngologists, pediatric surgeons or plastic surgeons, anesthesiologists, and specifically the pediatric anesthesiologists, pediatricians, speech, lang speech language pathologists, nutritionists, cleft nurses, psychologists, geneticists, and so on. The surgeons are more commonly available. And this probably because you have more specialties of surgery taking part in the repair of the defects are listed for sometimes in some instances, you have general surgeons who have interest in, you know, in, in certain places may even take part in the repair of the cleft. So surgeons are more available However, even among surgeons, specific skill sets are required for speech correcting surgeries like pharyngoplasties and also for appropriate performance of the traditional cleft palate surgeries that would enhance, you know, speech post-surgery. So other specialists are often in short supply. And this becomes a peculiar problem of particular notes in our environment. We have orthodontic shortages. Some centers do not have any at all. Then speech language pathologists are virtually non-existent. You know, so there is a need for these particular specialists and specialties. So these challenges with manpower dovetails into building teams because once you don't have the manpower, then we cannot build the cleft teams. So we find out that the holistic management of the cleft palate, which requires very strong cleft teams, cannot take place because the teams are incomplete. And ultimately, these would also dovetail into challenges with training, because once the manpower is not available, then we cannot train more manpower. Therefore, 
it's time for deliberate policies. And I put that in emphasis, a training manpower in the field of cleft care. Go on to the next slide. Challenges, preoperative challenges with the care of the cleft palate patients. Investigating and assessing the cleft palate patients is more challenging than that of a cleft lip. Basic investigations like nasal endoscopies, video fluoroscopies, you know, and more recently dynamic magnetic resonance imaging and so on, which are essential for documenting the cleft palate anomaly are often unavailable or they are too expensive for the cleft patients to afford, especially because many of those patients have to pay out of pocket for some of the investigations when the surgeries can be sponsored by you know, donor agencies like the Smile Train, but sometimes for them to be properly investigated, they need many of these investigations which are not covered by the sponsorships. And these investigations are critical, you know, for documenting the baseline and for evaluating the outcome of the surgeries and also for evaluating the outcome in terms of speech. So when these are not available, it becomes a major challenge. Cleft palates are also more commonly associated with syndromes. And so these syndromes may also require to be investigated you know, like investigating the cardiovascular system, you know, different anomalies involving, you know, the neurological system and all that. So these increase the body of the care that is required for the cleft palate patients and ultimately may either delay or, you know, ultimately result in inability to surgically intervene for some of those patients. And some of the patients, when they are unable to afford some of the care, they just might either default care, you know, or they just resign to fate. Of course, pre-surgical orthodontics is essential. This is often very expensive and is often not covered by sponsorships. Auditory assessments, in many of our institutions, patients have to pay for all this, you know, and the middle ear infections, the needs for insertion of Gromes tubes to drain the middle ear and all that. So speech evaluation also is important. These the patients have to take care of and be responsible for. So all of these together, you know, pose a very strong challenge for the care of the cleft palate patient compared with that of the cleft lip. And of course, psychological and social assessment and impact is often overlooked. And uh, this may be responsible for some of the reasons why the patients may choose one path or the other, you know, later on in their care. So it's important to look at all this as a whole when we are looking at the cleft palate patient because the surgeon may sometimes not be too enthusiastic when he is unable to adequately assess. And even when surgeries have been performed, how is he able to assess the outcome of his surgery when some of these critical investigations are unavailable? Other challenges, I move on to the challenges with anesthesia. Pediatric anesthesiologists is, in, in particular are in short supply. Yes, we would expect that most anesthesiologists should be able to take care of these babies. But research has shown that the outcomes when patients are managed, when children are managed in pediatric hospitals, you know, is usually better because when you have pediatric anesthesiologists who specific, you know, who specialize in children, they, they, they are much more familiar and uh, more proficient with handling some of these babies, many of whom are malnourished, are low weight for age. And, uh, you know, this is, is a major challenge. Monitoring equipment, like pulse oximeters and the like, where they are available, sometimes there's a need for repair or maintenance. There's a lack of the necessary support for such repairs and maintenance. You know, sometimes appropriate tools like endotracheal tubes. These 
at some point was a challenge to us. So there's a need for armor tubes, unlike in the cleft lip where the regular endotracheal tubes can be used. In the palate, because it's a shared airway and you need to put in mouth gas, then the, the risk of compressing the tube, if it's not an armor tube or if it's not a reinforced tube, is there. And uh, then you, you find out that as a surgeon, you're constantly you know, struggling with the anesthesiologist who is trying to keep the patient alive. So these tubes, you know, we need to make sure they're available. Nesotracheal intubation sometimes in unilateral palates, you know, we have used that. Of course, that also requires the appropriate training and specialization. Then the monitoring of the airway, you know, is important so that airway pressure can be assessed so that the, the, the pressure on the tube does not, you know, compromise breathing. And of course, the anesthetist usually would put in a pack and the surgeon may need to adjust this. And I mentioned before that, you know, patients may require intensive care unit backup. So many of these are more cost intensive. They require more specialist care and they are not often very readily available. So sometimes for the lack of these, the cleft palate patients just might not get operated. I move on to the next slide, which is about surgery, instrumentation, adequacy and appropriateness of instruments is very important. For instance, at the beginning, I put up this next slide showing the Boyd Davis retractor, which we had at the beginning before we were able to get the Dingman's retractor. And we can see that it's obvious that the amount of exposure that you're able to achieve using the Dingman's retractor is way better than that of the Boyd Davis. You know, for several years, we, we had to just make do with this Boyd Davis until we were able to, you know, get around to get Dingman's retractors. So this is very important because you're operating in a the, in the pallet in, in a hole, as it were. Apart from access and the uh, retractors, other instruments are also critical. Hooks, dissectors, you know, all these need to be available and they, they need to be adequate. And sometimes some surgical consumables, as minor as they may appear, may just not be there. You know, surgical blades, especially like the size 12 blade, where you need to make incisions in the anterior aspects of the palate, you know, it just, just might not be available. And it can be very challenging practically when you need to make these incisions, you know, in, in the process of dissection. So all of these, the surgeon has to think about all this and be prepared for them. So a lot of times you find out that as a surgeon, you, you need to make appropriate provision for this. For if you call for them and they're not available, you just get stuck right in the middle of the surgery. And then the next time you just might not be too excited, you know, going after a cleft palate. Appropriate sutures, you know, are also important of appropriate size. Most commonly we use the 5 vicryl suture most, most of the time, you know, but the quality is also essential. These days, all, all sorts of, you know, uh, sutures of different qualities come in. And if you don't get the right suture at some point, you have some sutures that would just unknot on you right on the table, even before your surgery is complete. Of course, if you are unfortunate to end up using such sutures, I mean, the outcome of the surgery is, is best imagined. So sometimes you need to go after ensuring this yourself. Illumination at surgery is important, you know, because we in practice is an environment where sometimes power supply cannot be, you know, 100% guaranteed. So headlamps can be very helpful in this regard. You know, headlamps that help you to focus better at the site of surgery. The role of magnification, especially when we're operating you know, 
is it, it cannot be overemphasized. You know, the, the, this is also important because uh, as we age, you know, the vision may dim somewhat and with age comes experience. So even when you are more experienced by reason of age to handle some of the cases, if the magnification that should assist your surgery is not available, then rather than cause more harm, you just might want to, you know, you, you skip the, the pallet patients. Your instruments should be fine, sharp, not worn out. So adequate replacement, things as, as minor as suction tubes, suction nozzles, and, you know, mouth props, things that would normally be taken for granted in, in some other settings, maybe things that we need to, you know, pay attention to and make sure they are available because all of this become very important, you know, at different stages of your care. For instance, the mouth props, like the one I show here on these slides, we had to get this because initially, we were repairing pallets and putting in packs in the, 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 the lateral dissections, which we had to remove, you know, post-operative day three to five. And uh, we realized that getting the patient to open his or her mouth, especially with the pediatric patients became an issue. And a struggle. Do you take the patient back for anesthesia? But something as basic as this, uh, Atkinson's mouth props, found very useful to keep the, the, the jaws apart and the, the patient steady while we take out the, the parts. So we, we don't commonly use parts anymore. So these are some of the things that could pose a challenge. Then even documenting the outcome of the surgery in that immediate post-operative period to know when does a, a breakdown or a dehiscence, when has it occurred? If you're unable to view appropriately, the, you know, becomes challenging. So what you may even be reporting what is not very accurate because if you're unable to see and assess as appropriately as you should, because some of these basic instruments are not available, you know, these could in, in themselves, you know, pose a significant uh, challenge. So, I go on to some challenges with the techniques of surgery. I mean, using my own experience and I hope it can benefit a few people. The first thing I realized was that the, the, the common diagrams we have about the cleft palate repair in most of our textbooks, you know, as trainees, <laughs> I found them rather de deceptive as it were because uh, you know, the, the diagrams will just be drawn and it will appear as if, you know, you just open up the flaps, bring the edges together. But practically, in reality, the, the, the flaps just won't move. They just won't come together. So this, you know, was, was the first, you know, thing that... So then again, we've talked about access for the surgeon. Sometimes the surgeon himself is, is, is you know, struggling to, to, to really get a whole graph. So the assistance is, you know, it's not as effective as it should be. So these, these are the peculiar issues with palate. Then your incisions, the handedness of the surgeon, sometimes you, you, when you're incising the opposite edges of the, the palate, you know, you need to train to be able to use your left hand you know, because that would be the most appropriate way. So there's a need for more training to get your hands steady because when you make incisions, you don't want the incisions to fray or, you know, you don't want to pair the edges of the tissues. You want your incisions to be very precise because when it's time to bring the edges together, every millimeter of tissue becomes very important. So carefulness with incisions and uh, with dissection, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very important. Then hemostasis, dilute adrenaline solution. We've had challenges with this. Sometimes we have been given adrenaline solutions that just would not, you know, cause vasoconstriction. 
The wait time for the use of adrenaline is said to be seven to 10 minutes. Some studies have reported as much as 26 minutes, you know, for it to be effective. But, so it's important to take note of this so that when you expect the adrenaline to be effective, you know, that would enhance visibility and, you know, help to keep your surgery on course. Of course, hydrodissection is a very important principle, which we're all familiar with. We've talked about sharp dissection, gentle handling of tissues, avoid tearing, avoid sharing. So all of these can, you know, make it difficult. Once the tissues are traumatized, especially at the edges which you hope to bring together, you know, in, in, in the final repair, you know, if the tissues, you know, have suffered trauma, then the risk of, you know, fistulation and all that becomes more. So see, these are some of the technical challenges where we need to, you know, pay particular attention. Then I also, this, you know, observed that it appeared that the palatal tissues are more, uh, you know, lose their pliability with age. So it appears that when the, the palate is operated at an earlier age, the, the mucoperiosteal flaps appear to be more pliable, more elastic and more mobile than when they are operated, you know, much later. So probably this may be the reason why some surgeons tend to operate as early as nine months. You know, some have even gone earlier. So, and in our environment where delay is a challenge, so the more the delay, then we find out that this uh, challenge becomes more prominent. In mobilizing the microperiosteal flaps, it's important to observe the principles we talked about above. The lateral uh, palatal space dissection is also important. And we found out that the Dingman's retractor is very helpful, you know, in, in this regard. It gives you a lot of room to be able to dissect the lateral palatal space, where some older surgeons have talked about fracturing the hamulus to help in the medial mobilization of the mucoperiosteal flaps. The most surgeons do not do that anymore, but some surgeons also divide the, the tendon of the tensor palati in, in that space. And the, the purpose of which is also to relax the tension on that the tensor tendon poses on the medial mobilization of the flaps. You know, some surgeons have talked about the, the use of osteotomies. You know, some surgeons also do not, and said even very experienced surgeons have said they do not use osteotomies around the greater palatine. But I found a, an interesting uh, study which I would uh, show, uh, you know, later on. But these are some of the techniques that have been described to help to mobilize the mucoperiosteal flaps, because the mobility of the mucoperiosteal flaps is critical especially when you need to cover the wider cleft. You know, the, the, mobi the mobilization is critical to ensuring that you get the tissues more medial enough to be able to close them in the midline. You know, some also have, you know, talked about the division of the periosteum around the exit of the greater palatine from the palatine bone. You know, I talked about division of the tendon, tensor tendon. So these are some of the technical things that one would need to get familiar with and be able to deploy, you know, in the surgery itself so that we can achieve adequate mobilization and ensure that the tissues come together in the midline, you know, to achieve closure. Again, it's important to match the surgery with desired outcomes for speech. And for this reason, the, the, the the performance of intravillar veloplasty, you know, as described by uh, Brian Somerlad, very important. And this, the use of follows technique also has, you know, gained a lot of, you know, momentum, especially for the incomplete clefts of, of the palate. So the use of follows, these help to realign the muscles so that the levator muscles are more anatomically reoriented to be able to achieve, you know, the desired outcome for speech, to achieve the velopharyngeal competence 
which will ensure that speech outcomes are better. So it's important to you know, consider some of these techniques for different types of cleft. I'll show a slide on that very shortly. And then some of the adjuvants that can help, you know, like fibrin glue, you know, platelet rich plasma and things like that are not commonly available. Some of these things can help with controlling bleeding and enhancing wound healing. So this is just a diagram to show the anatomy of the, the palate. You can see the, the tensor muscle hooking around, the, the tensor tendon hooking around the amulus. So when the lateral uh, palatal space is dissected, the tensor tendon, some have section the tendon. This helps to improve the medial movement of the mucoperiosteal flaps along with the lateral relaxing incisions. Then this other diagram where I'm putting the puzzle now just shows the different types of cleft. If you have the cleft of the soft palate, this type of cleft, we, we commonly just use the follows, you know, double opposing Z plastics, you know. And then when we have a complete cleft, it appears that the von Langenbeck, you know, is usually well suited to this. And then a follows can be incorporated into the soft palate end for appropriate realignment of the muscles. And then in this push, this that is labeled B, the, the VY technique is usually preferred to mobilize the palate more posteriorly to increase the length. And uh, so this study in 2019, also published in the Cleft Palate Prenofacial Journal, talks about medializing osteotomy, you know, in repairing the white cleft palate. And what they do is to do an osteotomy, you know, so that the artery can move more medially with the hope that this helps to, we don't do medializing osteotomies or any osteotomies at all for our cleft palate. And uh, I just found it interesting. And I think it's something that can be helpful, you know, especially when you're dealing with the white clefts for which the ability to bring the edges together is usually a major concern. Postoperatively, there's a need for adequate recovery room staff and training for them to be able to handle these patients because the surgeon may be busy with other you know, patients and the, as well as the anesthesiologist. So adequate training for you know, recovery room staff is essential. You need nursing, uh, uh, cleft nurses specifically trained for this purpose. You know, analgesia should avoid analgesics that depress respiration and the uh, dose reduction may be important. And then the need to look out for airway obstruction. These are very important because a patient may have some form of post-operative bleeding, reactionary bleeding, you know, from surgery. And uh, these can, you know, lead to airway compromise and the, the, the need particular attention. Then reviewing the wound, I talked about this earlier, you know, when the patient is unwilling to open the mouth in the post-op period, the child is still uncomfortable, then the use of props can be very essential. And then evaluating the outcomes in an objective manner using the investigations we have talked about earlier are important. And all of these are often not readily available. There are other challenges that may be you know, peculiar to resource poor environments. We talked about late presentations, especially in isolated cleft palate. Then non-compliance with follow-up sessions, like speech sessions. You know, and this is important because some of the patients, even once the defect is closed, they're just satisfied. And then they feel that, oh, they don't have enough resources to bring themselves down and to attend speech sessions. The patients may get fatigued or they may be prematurely satisfied as has been observed with many patients in Sub-Saharan Africa, where after the leap has been repaired, some of them do not present for repair of the palate, even though the treatment may be free. 
So the patients may be unwilling or the relatives may be unwilling to seek repair or re-repair in, in, in the instance that the patient has a dehiscence or a fistula. So this, you know, may ultimately, you know, diminish the quality of life. So these are, you know, serious and, and very real obstacles. And the, the, the surgeon also may lose interest if some of these challenges which we have tried to highlight are not appropriately addressed. You know, there are other challenges in our institutions, power supply, you know, institutional bottlenecks in accessing funding, you know, and sometimes industrial action by workers going on strike, you know, all of this. And then follow up on missions, a lot of cleft work especially in this part of the world is done on missionary basis. And there will be a need to transit from the traditional mission-based model to facility-based care to ensure that these patients are appropriately followed up and the holistic care is uh, achieved. In conclusion, I want to state that there's an urgent need for deliberate policies that are targeted at improving the numbers as well as a quality of manpower available for holistic cleft palate care. This is specific to cleft palates, especially because the cleft palate patients are suffering. And that the aspiring cleft palate surgeon should brace up for these and other challenges, which I believe are very surmountable. And then there's a need to regionalize care to strengthen multidisciplinary care. And this will help also in training more manpower and improve the overall quality of care to our cleft palate patients. And then funding bodies, as much as we're grateful to them for all they do, should consider enhancing the scope of sponsorship for cleft palate patients especially, especially with respect to their evaluation, treatment, and the follow-up. Acknowledgements, I want to thank my mentors, Professor Labanji, Professor Gini, Dr. Hooper, who were mentors to me in cleft palate surgery. And I want to thank the smile train who made it possible for us to treat most of these patients free of charge and therefore helped us to build capacity for care of cleft palate patients. These are some of my references. I want to thank you very much for your time and for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Oladili for that uh, very educative, uh, informative, and highly illuminating lecture on the, the cleft pali repair. Again, you have taken us to the whole gamut of uh, information, you know, starting from the historical perspective and the actual cleft pali repair, including some of the challenges. I'm sure we're all excited and um, we have quite some questions in the, um, in the question and answer uh, box. And uh, if you still want to ask one or two questions, you'll put your questions on the question and answer box. So thank you very much. Once again, Dr. Olalide, we appreciate your presentation. And uh, thank you. We, we have some questions which we want to uh, like you to attend to. Um, as a matter of fact, I think we have about, about we have 55 participants, attendees on this, uh, on this uh, uh, lecture. The first question I want to ask is, uh, I think from Barbara uh, Deledge. Say thank you, doctor, for choosing to discuss this topic. Why is pilot examination not compulsory at the time of delivery? Aren't obstetricians and midwives trained to examine the pilot? The systematic palate examination at BAT will help identify all cases of isolated uh, palate, cleft palate, bone, 
in health facilities and prevent the risk of morbidity and mortality in this population. So maybe you should just take that question one after the other. Let's, let's go on to, maybe you should just yes. answer that. Yes. Thank you very much for the questions. Some of the peculiarities of bath in our own part of uh, the world here is that a lot of bath does not take place in the traditional hospitals where they are, you know, taken by, you know, trained midwives, you know, and all that. A lot of the uh, bath is still, you know, taking place in homes, which we refer to as traditional bath attendants. Many of those people are not prop as they are not trained as uh, they, they, they are not formally trained, you know, and uh, from time to time, we we'll still find them, you know, omitting some of these uh, defects. But for most of the patients who are, you know, uh, the, the patients who are born in the hospital, definitely the midwives, they do a thorough examination. The pediatricians also examine the patient before the patients go home. But a huge number of our patients who are still born in some of these outside facilities, you know, they fall into these categories of those that are missed. Okay, so thank you very much for that answer. The other question is from, one of the questions is also from uh, um, Semiyu Adetunyi Adeniyi. Say, thank you for your presentation, sir. Why does cleft surgeons, including nomadic cleft surgeons, tend to avoid cleft palate surgeries? Yes, thank you very much for the question. I'll try to highlight some of the reasons in my presentation the sorry can you take that can you take the answer again because some of us lost somewhere along the line because of network can you can you take it again dr ladele We seem to have a network problem. Okay. Sorry, the network uh, went off. Okay. Yeah, over to you. You were trying to answer that yes. particular question. Yeah. Yes, I was trying to explain that. That's why I've explained some of those reasons. That's why there's a need to transit from these mission-based models, you know, like the nomadic cleft surgeons you talked about. There are probably those that come on mission, maybe for a week or less, you know, do surgeries and go away. The risk of post-operative complications are higher and the surgeon does not want the patient to suffer those consequences. So we'd rather not operate, you know, than to operate and leave the patient to suffer post-operative consequences when he or she would not be available to take care of them. So we need to transit from these uh, mission-based models or the nomadic, as that uh, question put it, to institution-based care so that the patients can, you know, be given the best and receive holistic care. Thank you. Thank you. Then another question from the same uh, uh, person, Dr. Semiyu Adetunji Adeni. Say, sir. From your experience, how often do you see cleft lip and palate or cleft palate only from your center? Yes. Yes, we, we see uh, cleft lip and palate patients on, on the average in a week, let's say maybe two to three, you know, maybe a little less. I don't have uh, very precise uh, statistics, you know, and uh, in the past, they used to be this much, but more recently with more centers, you know, with uh, surgeons who are able to take care, especially of the cleft lip, you know, some of these uh, numbers have uh, diminished over time. 
Mm. Okay. The well, the last, the last um, question that we have on the question and, an and answer chat box. I mean, box is um, from Barbara Delerge. Say thank you again for for your lecture today. Uh, based on spine train surgery records, isolated cleft palate only represent eight percent of all cleft surgeries in Africa. Do you think this percentage is reflecting the relative proportion of isolated cleft palate cases among all cleft cases? Or do you think surgical records underestimate the true prevalence of isolated cleft palate in the population? Or do you think we are missing only a few or very many patients with isolated cleft palate as Kubit paper suggested. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I think that we probably have more cases of isolated cleft palate overall, because even until very recently, we are still seeing patients presenting as adults with isolated cleft palate. You know, as we, uh, we've been with small train since 2006, you know, and uh, up till the last year, we are still seeing people coming, you know, with uh, isolated clear palates, even in adulthood. So the likelihood is that the hospital-based uh, statistics is not likely to be accurate. But nevertheless, we still need to, you know, show so much gratitude to Smile Train because one of the things they have helped us to achieve is to begin to build a database. You know, one of the challenges we know we have in this part of the world also is that a lot of uh, systems are, are either ill-equipped, you know, to, 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 to really build a strong database. But we are working on this and we're, we're trying to improve on our database. So definitely, I, I think very much that we are missing out on more cases of isolated cleft palate. You know, some of them only come in adulthood when they are unable to speak properly, you know, and they, they, that is especially the more the milder forms. The milder forms, isolated, uh, you know, involving the soft palate or just uh, the posterior part of the hard palate. Thank you. Right. I think we, okay, we have another one uh, from Aliyu Uman Fanyaru. They thank you for this highly educating uh, presentation. Uh, what are your recommendations? on how to mitigate some or most of the challenges faced by cleft care specialists in Nigeria. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Liu, for your question. Uh, the first thing I would recommend is that there's a need for the cleft practitioners to come together more often. That way we can share about some of these challenges. Some of them may have been overcome by our colleagues in other locations or in other centers. We can learn from their experience, the way they over, you know, came those challenges. So this kind of networking among cleft practitioners, and uh, we really need to also emphasize that, you know, very recently on the 17th of uh, November, there was a stakeholders meeting, you know, in Lagos, in the Southwest region. So I think this can be, you know, expanded to other geopolitical zones of the country. Cleft care practitioners can come together they can share experiences on some of these challenges, and then we can work together with one another to, you know, overcome them. I believe very strongly that most of these challenges are uh, uh, surmountable. Thank you. Yeah, maybe the, the, the final question here, or the very last one here, is that um, it's from Paul Lobby. I say thank you, sir, for your presentation. Given your first experience in let Pali repair. What advice do you give to surgeons that will encourage them to uh, want to go into uh, cleft pali repairs? Advice given to surgeons who wants to go into uh, cleft pali. And I know you've mentioned quite some of them. I mean, some of them. Maybe you want to yeah. throw more light on this. Yes, I, I mentioned a, a number of them in my presentation, but I think that the, the, the surgeon should make up his mind 
that he really wants to help these patients. You know, one of the things I think to myself is that if we have bodies who are ready to provide funding to help these patients, I don't think as practitioners we will be fair on cleft palate patients in our own environment if we will not try to overcome whatever obstacle is on the way to help us to be able to help these patients. So I think that that commitment, you know, becomes pivotal in, in helping the cleft palate surgeon. Of course, the issues of training are there. You know, you can never be too trained. You should take advantage of training opportunities, you know, network and link up with the, you know, mentors, senior colleagues, you know, share experiences, you know, and uh, of course, over time, you know, more capacity will be built because the, the, the learning curve can be steep sometimes, but it, it's surmountable. But once the drive is, you know, constant, once the drive remains, I think that uh, the, the future will be bright. And most importantly, we'll be able to help these patients who depend so much on us, because without it, many of them would live suboptimal lives. And uh, I believe that that's one of the things that we should try to overcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Oladeli. Let me end this session by asking, I mean, uh, this question as a moderator. Now, during your presentation, you mentioned that um, the clear palate can be repaired as early as nine months. Yes. Sir. Uh, yes sir. Now, but as an orthodontist, I wonder what the, if the effect of that on the growth of the max life, because it's believed that if you repair the palate very early, it's, uh, it restricts the growth of the maxilla, and then the patient end up in class three skeletal malocclusion, whereby the, the maxilla is, uh, is not well developed. So what your, what's your take on that? Yes, sir. This continues to be an area of uh, debate, as, as it were, you know, and uh, apparently uh, a, a, a resolution seems not to have been reached. You know, but I know some, some surgeons still do that, you know, the repair early. But even the generally acceptable time frame is about 18 months, which is still relatively early, you know. And some surgeons have actually preferred repairing the cleft palate first, you know, that when the cleft palate is repaired at the time of the repair of the cleft lip, and then the repair of the heart palate can take place at a later date, about five to six years. You know, okay. so as to avert this, uh, you know, uh, challenge that you, you just raised, the mid-phase retrusion that may occur. Yes. Well, we thank you very much, Dr. Oladeli. I think we have come to the end of this uh, lecture. And uh, I want to appreciate the fight train for organizing this and uh, for inviting me to be part of it. And uh, I also want to thank every attendees on this uh, this uh, this lecture and uh, once again i want to say that uh, the program continues tomorrow and we want everybody to uh, join this uh telling class lecture so once again i thank you dr lali and all the attendees over to you thank you very much it's been my pleasure Thank you all and thank you, Professor Olainka, for such a great moderation. Thank you, Dr. Oladele, for such a comprehensive and very educative um, information that we've had on cleft palate management overall, not just in the surgery, but also in its management in the community. So we want to thank every participant who have been here. And we hope to see you tomorrow, same time, 11 a.m. GMT plus one. And uh, please remember to invite more people as we are going to we are going towards the end of the telecleft series three thank you all and uh, have a wonderful day and week thank you thank you